We're building a new chimney to look old. We're going to be hiding the shower drain in plain sight. And the style on our Narragansett project is Queen Anne. And that means decorative shingles. You know what they say, the money's in the detail. You got it. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a big deal. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> Money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hey there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Narragansett, Rhode Island where we're working on this house from the 1880s. Ryan, good to see you. Hey, so the house is in the historic district and that means that the commission has got a lot to say but mostly on the outside. Inside, as you can see, almost all new. And this part right here is an addition. We've got a first floor garage with a second floor master suite going up there. This mudroom area right here with an entrance to the front and back is new. We got a little bathroom. And then right here starts the original house, which as you can see is back down to the studs. And it has been opened up. So we've got a front living room area right there. That screened in porch has been now um, enclosed. So that's four seasons. We're gonna have the kitchen area right in here, all new. Little pantry there and what was the dining room well, this is still going to stay a dining area, but open up to the entire space. So a lot going on inside. Now back, well, there's quite a bit going on out here despite the small space. This corner, which used to be the driveway into the area, is actually, believe it or not, going to be a little putting green. And then as you come around here, there'll be a shed for some of the outdoor equipment. And then off of the back here, that's the entrance to the mudroom, there's going to be a deck with a seating area right here, and then just behind it, a plunge pool. And then we've got a whole set of other stuff going on over here. Jeff, good to see you. Matt, how are you? Kevin. Um, so, busy place out here. Yeah, <laughs> but also, a work spot for you guys. Yeah. Brick work, what's going on? Brick work. So, remember, we took that old chimney down. We basically demoed it all the way to the basement. We no longer needed a masonry flue, but we did have to keep a historic component of it. So the section through the roof, we're going to rebuild with the old bricks. Gotcha. Okay. So these are the original bricks yeah. that you guys took down. Yeah. So Matt cleaned them up. You know, basically every single brick had a yeah. layer of mortar on it. And All right. So Matt, what's your process? What are you starting with? Uh, well, I'm getting the bricks mortar ready. These are all of the bricks that were salvaged. Oh yeah. So take them down right through the house, throw them in a bucket, and then you're left with a pile. Correct. Some of them uh, have pretty substantial cracks, so that's something we'll discard, put off to the side. Can't use that. Something like this, that's just what we're looking for. Can use this one. So if you get a brick like this, what, uh, like how clean do you need to get it back to? Uh, we're really concerned about the tops being clean with it. Yeah. Um, this, we're going to respect the, the condition of the sides of it. That's what's going to be exposed. So the face here, we'll see. Correct. Try to go light on that, but yeah. then the mortar side, get it as clean as you can. That's all going to be cleaned off, yeah. All right, so what's your process? So first we go with a cold chisel and just get all this stuff off. They actually clean up pretty nicely. Yeah. So how much of this chimney are you guys rebuilding? Hey, Mark's upstairs working on it right now. Let's go check in with him. All right. So remember what this chimney used to look like. It had that big cant slope on it, and it went from one side of the building to the center here. Craziest chimney I ever saw. So we had to reproduce the chimney for the historic district on the exterior, yeah. but we didn't need all of this chimney through two floors of the house. That is all gone. That real estate was too valuable. Yeah. So we calculated what this chimney would weigh okay. when so it what was is done. That? It's, it's the, the cinder block plus the brick plus times the, brick. the linear feet of what you got exactly. left? Exactly. It was like it was like 2,000 pounds. All right. And so uh, we had a structural engineer design this saddle system here. Yeah. Uh, we've reinforced the rafters. We've through bolted that saddle. So one rafter goes to three. You sister them right there. Yep. And then you hook it onto this? Exactly. That's <laughs> awesome right there. That's a lot of steel, actually. Yeah. And, and so what, the block just goes right through the ridge? The block goes through the ridge, and then the rest is brick. 
And that's Mark's job. That's Mark's. All right, well, I know he's up there, so I'll go check him out. All right. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, Kevin. Hey, you got a crew up here, huh? I do, I have a couple Masons with me, Andrew. Andrew? This is Mark. Mark, nice to meet you guys. You too. So I gotta admit, this is a first for me. <laughs> Just right. the top tenth of a chimney. Right, so in this instance, we're using a gas fireplace, so we don't have to use a conventional masonry fireplace. But it will be functional. This is not just decorative. It's definitely gonna be functional. Right. What we have to do, as you can see, we have four inch cinder block. All right. We're gonna bring that right, right through the roof as we did. Yep. We're gonna go a little bit above the ridge. On top of that, we're gonna build our flashing. So we'll install flashing all the way down the bottom, all the way back up at the ridge. Gotcha. And we'll tie it into the masonry. And then on top of that, because of the historical commission, we're gonna end up using the original brick to the house. Check I that out. Yeah, so I saw these being cleaned down below. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me, uh, clean it up nice on the mortar sides and then go easy on the face side, keep some of that patina. Well, that's the character of the brick. And again, it's been 120 something years for that to develop, so why lose it? Cool. So mark number two, are you slinging mud today? Is that? I am. All right, well, I'd love to see this next course go down. All right, let's get at it. Just itching to grab a trial, aren't you, Mark? <laughs> These old Queen Anne Victorians, the exterior is all about the detail. The clapboards that fan at the top in straight rows of clapboards. Then you get into shingles that are stepped courses. You got straight courses. You got scalloped courses and another row of straights. It's really beautiful. The project is really coming along nicely, We're working on the outside trim now, getting ready to do some of the stepped shingle siding. And it's uh, pretty cool to see this done. It's done with, uh, first of all, you have a straight edge to drop your shingles onto, like you would using if it was a straight row. But the stepped row, you notice one is up and one is down. You can do that a couple of different ways, right, Adam? Sure can. But you've chosen a spacer block at your chosen space. We've chosen an inch and a quarter today. Yep. That's what the architect, architect expect. And you're just going to take your shingle and you're going to drop it on. So the next one would obviously go low. You want to have a slight space for the shingles to expand and contract in. Drop that on. The next one would be raised. Drop it on your block. Space it out. You also want to make sure that the shingle joint is far enough away from the joint below because you want to make that watertight. Now we take a wider one. It's all random in width. You look at our width. You see how we're covering that joint really well? Drop it down. People wonder how you do your corners. Example of the shingles right here. This is actually called a woven corner where you're actually staggering the joints. So you make a joint on this one on this side, no join on this side, it's on this side, join on this side, and no join on this side, so on down the line. Basically by offsetting the shingles and feathering them in like that, you're creating a watertight joint. So one way, next way, so on down the line, that makes it tight. All right, so now we're ready for the next course up, and you've got a story pole all marked off. This is the bottom, next course, next course, next course, and these lighter lines are the raised courses. So you just hold it against it, and you work your way up. So now, line up that line right there, mark the next course, and we'll snap it with the corner that you've got woven down the other end. Good. So when you're nailing shingles to the sidewall, you want to try to keep them down as low as you can get them without seeing them from the shingle below. You want to make sure that that nail gets covered up. You also want to make sure that you use a nail or a staple that is wider 
No, nothing, quarter inch is not good. A, a box nail, which has a nice round head on it, will grab the fibers of the shingles. If you use a finished nail, the sun will actually pull them right off. You never use a finished nail for that. You also want to try to keep the, the staple a half to one inch from the edge, which is nice, and no more than two staples or nails to a shingle, so you don't need anything in the middle. Let's get a look, see how this is. Oh yeah, that's nice. really looking good, Adam. All right. You know what they say, the money's in the detail. You got it. This beam, we're gonna cut to size. We're gonna send it outside, and then that's gonna slip in. This gets welded on all the way around. So this was a dirt floor basement. We dug down and added footings and then poured a slab on top of that. That enables us to post all the way down to the foundation to carry this load. We have a temporary post and a clamp, and so that I'm able to go to our snap line. So Jeff, you guys uh, worked all throughout the five month shutdown from COVID and we're very busy. And a lot of that work was actually put in a ton of steel. Yeah. Yeah, so we basically took a six room house and made it into two open rooms. And as a result, we had to create some support. So we designed this steel structure, not only to support the load, but also to be hidden in a coffin ceiling, which will come later. Just down the street from our project house is the ferry that takes people to one of Rhode Island's most beautiful tourist spots, Block Island. I've been bringing my family here for years. And every summer since 2009, something magical happens out here. The island is home to miles of beaches and dunes, trails, and beautiful outdoors. And for anybody who enjoys those outdoors, they can find something special treasure unique to Block Island. One of these, a beautifully formed glass orb. Every summer since 2009, thousands of these have been hidden throughout the island, on those trails, maybe in a pile of driftwood or up in a tree, for anybody to find. Evan Horton has been blowing glass since high school. His shop is one town over from our project. All right, Evan, you got to give me the history here. First of all, what is it? What is this thing? It's really simple. It's 550 glass Japanese fishing net floats or floats that we make here. They're hidden on Block Island. Whoever can find it can keep it. And why are you doing this? Because it's fun. <laughs> there was a time when I didn't have as much going on. I was a little slow after the Great Recession and I thought it would be a good um, thing to keep me busy. I thought it was going to be a one year thing but it became so popular on the island, I just kind of kept doing it, kept doing it, and now I'm kind of, I guess, along for the ride. And so when you say it's become so popular, tell me how popular it's become. I've been followed a lot. Um, I have to borrow friends' cars when I go out there because people, people see my Volkswagen, they're like, <laughs> there's Eben. Um, and they follow you because no one knows where they are. Right. So if they can catch Santa in the process. Yeah, that, yeah then the odds are, are in their favor, I guess. So tell me about the hiding process for you. What is that? Uh, I have a messenger bag just on my hip, and I'll put like 20 in there. And Jen and I will go for a, a walk. Just scatter them. I have favorite places I'll hide, but that always sort of changes. Yep. Um, if I see a tree that has a hole in it, I'll put one in the tree. Uh, I love hiding them about that high and like a branch. Um, every time I go out and hide during daylight, I walk by people looking for them and they ask me if I found them. I go, no, just keep going. Uh, every year, 
I, well, I number them one through 550. Float number one is always a special one that's either coated in gold leaf or this year with the coronavirus happening, I made a coronavirus. And then each one gets inscribed? They get numbered with a Dremel and a little diamond bit and then dated. Tell me about the process of making them. This is a, a two-person shop generally, you and your wife? Me and my wife, I have two other assistants that help us from time to time, um, but generally it's, it's us too. So the large furnace holds 350 pounds of glass. Once a week, I fill it up, what's called doing the charge, and just raw sand and all of the other things that make glass are all mixed together. It's thrown in. The following day, it's full and it's crystal, crystal clear, ready to be drawn. Um, and then to actually make the floats, we use blowpipes, which are a hollow metal tube. Gather glass out of the furnace. We shape it, like center it, like a potter would center on a potter's wheel. Put a bubble into it, and then just slowly blow it up. Not too thin, though. I, I have to keep them pretty thick. They're actually quite sturdy. Yeah. Yeah, you can drop them and they won't break. Yeah turn them into a ball, then where do you go from there? I let it cool a little bit, not too much, so it's just, just solid. Then it gets knocked off the blowpipe, and then a little stamp is applied. So a glob of glass is put on top of the ball, and then I push down with a stamp. It's, it's like putting a wax seal on a letter. And then it goes into that oven where it cools down overnight. If I didn't do that and just let them cool naturally, they would probably split in half or, or explode. The rules yeah. for the people who come from all over, who are on the island looking, do they have rules? They do. If they find one, they can keep it. If they find another one, I ask they rehide it, following the rules that I follow to hide them. And hiding them is almost as fun as finding them. Every so often, Eben asks friends to help him hide the orbs, and this year he's included us on that list. So he has given us about a dozen or so to spread around the island. And I'm going to do that with the help of our homeowners. Michael and Cassie Nee have brought their two children to lend a hand. Now, some people might recognize that as the north light behind us. Well, we might put them on this trail, we might not. We're not telling you where they're going. Eben has a few rules for hiding them, okay? So on the beaches, you want to go above the high tide line, keep them off of the protected dunes. On the trails, just a few feet in so that people don't have to go too far and keep them away from the cliffs or the bluffs. Yeah. You guys got it? It's an awesome spot to hide this orb. All right, guys, check this out, huh? Wow. Yeah, well, remember, you're not supposed to put them near the bluff, so you're going to have to keep that with you. But you guys can take the view with you, though. Have a look. Absolutely beautiful. All right. What do you say, gee, what do you say we drop them right by the path over here? Right here. Let's see, hold on. Nice. Drop that mic. Nice job. Good job. That's good. Good job, buddy. Oh, she's got a tree in mind, huh? Beautiful. All right, a couple more to go. Let's keep going. All right. More to do. More to do. All right, guys, we have got one more task. Now, Evan, every once in a while, will throw one into the water. Lulu, come on over here. So we've got one more to go. We're going to throw it into the water. Who knows where to wash up, but hopefully somewhere on the island. Julian, you ready? All right, ready, go. Oh! There she goes! Back here in Narragansett, progress continues. Here's the old part of the house. Here's the new work, the connector that goes to our master suite. 
There's a master bedroom right here and a really beautiful master bathroom. Our plumber extraordinaire, Josh Jordan, is on site. Hey, Josh. Hi, Rich. How are you today? Update us. Where, where are you at? Uh, we have some uh, wall-mounted faucets and some labs roughed in over on this side. Okay, that means the faucets are right in the wall behind the tile. Floating sinks right here. Love that. Water closet. Tucked away. Uh, big, beautiful cast iron tub Look with another wall-mounted faucet. Perfect. And a very big shower. Yes, yeah, a very elaborate shower. We have rain heads, body sprays, handhelds, steam, yeah. uh, and it's also curbless. They want it to be curbless. So curbless means that the height of this floor continues right through, and that's what everybody would like. Now, conventionally, whenever we've had a custom tile shower, we've always had to have a curb, and it had a good function. You build it up right here, and then you put your copper pan or your rubberized membrane to make it waterproof, and then you'd have a drain like this somewhere in the center. Then the tile person would come and fill this with what they call mud and ferret with pitch back towards the drain and then apply tile so the water would pitch to the drain. But that always meant a big curb right here. So if you tried to do this with a, to move that to the back with mud, starting from this point, by the time you got to the back, it would be so thin that the mud could crack. Now this manufacturer came up with a system. This is actually ground up uh, bottles, water bottles, in a, called PET, a plastic. And you can, do you see the pitch right here? So now they can put this down on the substrate and allow you to pitch the water from a very low starting point here and work it towards the back. Now, it also invites using a linear drain like this uh, that would allow the water to come to, into this drain. But why do that when you can actually make the drain go all the way to the back and disappear completely? So you can see here's the stainless steel uh, acceptor with the pipe and the drain. Now the cutaway helps to understand this I think perfectly. You can see here's that substrate, here's the tile floor of the shower, here's the stainless steel drain. Now to make it waterproof, there's a, a waterproof tape, an applied rubberized sealant, the mastic itself to hold the tile, and then the tile. And then to cover up this opening, look at this, here is the cover with the tile applied, you can see it's stainless steel, and there's a magnet catch, and that's the finished look. Beautiful. All right, Josh, what's left for you here? Uh, we have to put in the uh, forehead rain head system. That's four heads. Yes, yeah, four heads, gonna go out of the ceiling. Uh, a little bit of piping left to do on the wall, hook up the drain, and good. that's about it. This shower will be steamed before you know oh, it. Oh yeah, well, thanks for your good work. Next time on This Old House. Our project is loaded with hardscape, but today we're going to take a look at the softer side. So this area is going to be planting. Correct. So we talked about maybe an ornamental tree, maybe a Japanese maple. Yeah. But I think soft. you, yes. Soften the area. That's what you're interested yep. in, right? Yep. And I'll show you a way to replicate a 130-year-old shingle.